What is the Moo major chord that Steely Dan is famous for? What on earth is a stack o fourths voicing, and how do they relate to the minor 11th chord? Stay tuned and find out. You don't have to be a Steely Dan fan to get a lot out of this lesson, as the secrets of these chords have been used by many artists. I'm going to explain what the Moo major chord is and show you a few different voicings. I'll demonstrate its relationship to the stack to the stack of fourths voicing and how that relates to the often misunderstood minor 11th chord. At the end of the video, I will play the chord progression 1, 2, 5 in B flat major, which would be B flat major is 1, 2 is C minor 7, and 5 would be F7. And I'll show you every possible stack of fourths that can be justified over those three chords. Stack of fourths is when you just take notes and just go up by fourths and you try to form chords around that. And that idea should open up some huge pathways in your songwriting and arranging horizons. Just like the jazz artists that Donald Fagan and Walter Becker grew up listening to, Steely Dan were always trying to fit more color into their chords. If you take a major chord and you add a nine to it without adding a seven, so that would be, there's that nine, but not a seven because it colors it too much, this nine is kind of neutral. But the nine is kind of poking out on top also. So we had just an A major. I wanted to add a nine. But if you drop that nine an octave, it's actually just a two. So nine and two are the same note. You get this instead of that's a cool voicing there's a time and place for it but if you just want to make it more subtle instead of a major you have this you let that bass take care of the a the add two chord was not invented by steely dan and many jazz artists such as herbie hancock and bill evans and lots of others have been using this chord long before them steely dan use it so much in their song that it is pretty much a part of their signature sound. And if you are familiar with that, uh, when you start learning this chord, you're going to be like, oh, that's what that is. And there's other forms that it takes, too. Even though they are not the ones that invented it, I challenge you to find me many rock and pop artists that have been using this. I know there are some. I know there's been people through the 70s and 80s that have used this, but I can't think of anyone that's used it more and more effectively than they have. The name Moo Major itself was some kind of inside joke for Steely Dan, probably from Walter, I'm guessing, but the details are not really known. The main sound characteristic of the chord is that major two interval. It adds a bit of a tension, but it's, it's kind of a pleasant tension if there could be such a thing, because there's a lot of kinds of tension, right? There's so many kinds, but this, it's kind of a pleasant tension to add a two. There are a few ways you can voice this chord. I'll give you some examples with songs. The simplest one is the one I just showed you where you take a major chord and then you just move the one up to two and let the bass take care of one. And then you can do that through all the inversions. But if I do it here, then it's really just that at nine, which I was trying to avoid in the first place. And there's one other one, which would be like, that's kind of cool, it's tense. We're skipping the one because it's in the bass. So it was this, and all I did was move this up to here. So that's one, or those are the main voicings. Remember, we aren't calling it add nine, we're calling it add two, same note, it's just telling us, it's a reminder to us that we want it voiced in the lower octave here instead of, and like I said, that is a great voicing, but you gotta save that for the right time. I'm going to use a lesser known Steely Dan song as an example called Razor Boy, which might be about losing it all to a really bad coke habit. It's hard to tell with their lyrics, but that's what it seems like. But it also perfectly demonstrates this add two chord in full force. I'll play the song and you can listen. And I want you to pay a special attention to how much those add two chords add to the music. It's a neutral color, but it's a, a nice little pleasant tension that it adds. By neutral color, I mean to say that it adds a new sound to the chord, but without changing the basic harmonic function of the chord itself. You know, like if you would add a major seven, it, it just colors it too much. It makes it too definitive. So check out Razor Boy, I'll play it here, and I want you to just look at all those add two chords and listen to what they bring to the song. I'm gonna try to sing it, man. It's hard to imitate Donald Fagan. I did it on the second arrangement. You should go listen to that. Tim Smolin's The Second Arrangement. Uh. I hear you are singing a song of the past 
I see no tears I know that you know it may be the last For many years You gamble and give anything to be in with The better half How many friends must I have to begin with To make you Super cool. I, I I don't know. Leave in the comments below. Is there any song you've heard that uses that many major add two chords? Pretty freaking cool. So what you can take away from that as a songwriter is that any time you have a major chord, you can at least consider, should I make it an add two? You could go through your entire song chart and just try it. Every time you see a major chord, just try and add two see if it works or it doesn't work, and then go and make the changes to the places where you feel like it works. It's always an option. So there's this thing called the stack of fourths. When you take three notes, a fourth apart, and you make chords out of them, Donald talks about this on video, and jazz pianists have used this. Have used this uh, forever uh, to great effect. Uh, it's hard to explain why the stack of fourths works so well. It forces me into a philosophical terrain, and I'll be really brief here, but if you understand the harmonic series, when you play any note on an instrument, there's this series of notes ringing out in perfect mathematical relationships, one over one, two over one, three over one, four over one, into infinity. But what ends up happening, if we hit a C note, what rings out of C is a lot of notes, but the perfect fifths are super important. So those are actually manifest in any musical tone. So they, nature insists that they're there. And it's this real open sound. Now the opposite idea of going up a perfect fifth, and I want you to also notice that what actually gets created there is a pentatonic scale, right? That's the notes that come out of those perfect fifths if I reduce them all to the same octave. So interesting. But what's the opposite idea of going up a perfect fifth is going down a perfect fifth. So if I'm in C, going up a perfect fifth is G, but going down a perfect fifth is F. Put that all in the same octave and that there you have the fourths. So instead of this big wide open sound, just like Jacob Collier says, it closes off when you do fourths. And it see how much closer it gets? You have this really wide thing that closes off to so why is that interesting? Uh, this is philosophy, but music is a combination of you know joys and triumphs and tragedies of the human soul, and and we like that in music. We don't want you know perfect music. We like when our music is imperfect, and people are imperfect. So if nature is ringing out that there's this series of perfect fifths, and we want to be our defiant little human selves like we are and, and do the exact opposite and do perfect fourths, which would actually create the F minor pentatonic scale, th then that fo those fourths kind of represent that human strife, that human folly. It, it, it's, it's, the chords sound good, but there's a lot of tension there too, because it's not like those fifths, right? They're kind of new agey and just open out in this really nice sound, but... The fourths to me represent humans going against nature like we so frequently do. And as the listener, I think we gravitate to that. We say, hey, there's that human folly. I've got folly too. Let me grab onto those fourths. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that, of why the fourths are important when the harmonic series, and which is literally the laws of musical science, ring out fifths. We do the opposite and ring out fourths. Music is tension and release. You have to use that to your advantage. There is a more elaborate voicing of this Moo major chord, which really is just a major add two chord that sounds more grand and iconic, and you will surely recognize it from Steely Dan songs. In this voicing, what you do is stack three fourths from that add two. So if we were in G major, we go from the two, which would be A, and that's where we do our stack of fourths. But in this voicing, we put the major third in the bass. So that's the voicing here. So if, again, that's G major. We're gonna take a stack of fourths from the two. And that would look like this. Two, and that's five of the chord, and one of the chord. And we'll get the three of the chord in the bass. And we've all heard this, 
the Steely Dan. We find this song in the amazing intro chords for Deacon Blues. Right here. And then again, here. Take that whole thing up a whole step from where it started. Here's that chord again, that stack of fourths with the major third in the bass. So if that's the major third, we're in a, an A chord. One more time, I want you to listen to those uh, that chord. It's still just an add two, so if it's a G major, add two, we do a stack of fourths from there, and then do that major third in the bass, and there we have every note we need in for a G add two over B. So the Deacon Blues intro, here it is. Here it is again. Whole thing up a whole step. Here's that chord. Here it is again. Amazing. Whoops. So yeah, it's all over that. Uh, that's the two basic types. We have the kind where we just take a major chord and we do that. And then we have the type where we are going to take and put the third in the bass and then do a stack of fourths from the two. So that's a G major. Add two. There's the two. Five. One. There's the three of the chord. Now listen to the chorus of the same song, Deacon Blues, and we hear the chord C major add two over E, and it pushes up to an F major nine. Listen to how unique and powerful that chord is the way they use it. Not too many people in pop rock can wield that chord, and here it sounds absolutely fantastic. So the chorus of Deacon Blues... So cool. Can I do that one more time? It's so cool. I used to hear that. Uh, my dad played that all the time in the pool. And I'd be like, what is that chord? That's what it is. C major, add two. There's the two, the stack of fours, and there's the three in the bass. To F major nine. And I'm behind the wheel. Call me Deacon Blues. Super cool. And what do you know right there? That's the same. Is this thematic? And that's also what they do in Peg. In Peg, they take that idea of a, is it called a plagal cadence? Um, it's for G, and you go to five, but instead of going back to one, you go to four first. It's like a church ending. That's, a, I think it's called a plagal cadence. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, because you guys do that all the time. And I actually like it, because I don't know all the correct terms for some of these things. So four and G. So Donald said, go look up the video where Donald talks how he wrote this chord progression and demonstrates on the piano. It's unreal. He, he actually makes it from a blues. You would not believe it, that he's just thinking is... The whole thing is just the blues, but he decides, how can I spice it up? So instead of just being on one, why don't we start on four? And instead of a dominant chord, like it usually is in blues, let's make it a major seven. And then instead of going back to one, he wants to go four to one instead of just starting on one. He's going to do that, that same chord, the G add two over B. So it's really all just in G, crazy, but it goes C major seven, which is four, and then that's just one but it's G add two over B. No one's 100% sure, but the song Peg seems to be about a guy whose girlfriend left him for a career in the adult industry is what it sounds like to me. And then it takes that same progression. Oh gosh, I'm not good at it. Up a fourth, just like the blues would, then goes to the five. It runs it through a 12-bar blues progression, but in this really elevated. So for those of you who have not been turned on to the, the genius of these Steely Dan chord progressions, they can take a basic blues and turn it into something like that. 
read about how many guitar players they tried to have solo over that and fired because they couldn't understand that idea of blues but mixed with major at the same time. Now, no discussion about the Mu major chord and the stack of fourths would be complete without talking about the minor 11th chord. If you say minor 11th chord and you don't say add 11, you're also implying 9 and minor 7 too because it says minor 11. So for an E, 11 would be up there, there would be 9, there would be 7. It's a big chord. Really good jazz players are really good at omitting notes. They find which notes they don't want of a chord and they just kind of make the ones they do want. So anyway, they're unbelievable at that, and each pianist has their own personality with that kind of stuff. But let's say we take an E minor 11 chord. I'm just going to skip right to it here. E in the bass, but let's do a stack of fourths from the 11. So the 11, remember the, the mnemonic for down an octave is up a perfect fourth. That's the same thing as 11. So we're going to do a stack of fourths from 11. So we're in E minor, and there's the 11. There's minor seven, which we need, and there's minor three, which we need. We have everything we need. Some of you might recognize this from the Steely Dan song, Dr. Wu. It's after the intro chords, it goes into this minor vamp, and a lot of bands might just do E minor, you know. Some bands might do E minor seven. Maybe even minor six. Maybe minor add nine. But how many rock bands would do E minor 11? You get that 11, minor 7, and 3. Hear how much more colorful that is than just a regular minor? Here's a regular minor. Here's a regular minor 7. Now here's with that minor 11 with the stack of fourths voicing. So that is vaguely related to that idea of mu chords because mu chords are somewhat based on that stack of fourths. Any way you can get a stack of fourths, they'll take it. And yes, they use minor 11 chords all over their music, just like they use these Moo chords, as well as a bunch of other iconic chords. The dominant 7 sharp, 9 sharp, 5, which they use a lot. A lot of cool chords this group does, and they don't just, they're not just showing off their chords. They're really made a blend between a jazz harmonic language and a rock pop aesthetic. I'm going to show you a 1, 2, 5 progression in B flat, B flat major, C minor 7, F7. B flat. I'm going to show you every possible stack of fourths you can do over those chords. So here's B flat. Now the first one, let's do it from a major seven on bottom. So A, D, G. So that's a major seven and a six because we have major seven. There's a major three. There's a six. Now we're going to go back to G on the bottom and we have B flat six, nine, but no three. See how we went all stack of fourths? Then we're gonna go down to a sharp 11, a major seven sharp 11. That's a stack of fourths that works over B flat. Now we're gonna do B flat six, nine right there because we have major three, six, and nine. Then B flat add two, because there's the two, there's five, one. And then finally let's end on that major seven, six again. So over B flat or the one chord, those are all the notes that can come into play. Let's try it again. Pretty cool, right? Now we have the two chords, C minor 7, and we are going to start on the C stack of fourths. That's going to give us a 1, an 11, and a minor 7. So we'll call that C minor 11 because it's got the most of what we need for that. Then we're going to go down to A, D, G, and it'll give us a minor 6, 9. Then C minor add 11, G, C, F. Then also C minor 11, F, B flat, E flat. And then C minor add 9. Then C minor 11. So that's kind of nuts too, huh? Okay, now finally over the F7, let's do all the stack of fourths that work there. First one gives us a ADG, gives us a 13 and a 9. That's awesome. 
Take it down a half step, we get sharp nine, flat nine, sharp five, very tense, but remember I said dominant chords house tension? Then we walk it down another half step and we get just an F nine chord with a one on top, that's kind of bizarre. Then take it to the E flat and we get F seven, sharp nine, sharp five, relax it down to F 13, nine. Then down another half step gives us F seven, sharp five, flat nine. Then I'll resolve it back up to that F 13, nine. So crazy stuff, huh? Anyway, I hope that was helpful. Fourths are everywhere in music. They go against nature. By nature, I mean the harmonic series. Look it up. I have a video on that, Harmonic Science. Uh, please check that out, and you will understand a little bit more about that. But those fourths that jazz uses are part of that tension that we use for tension and release. So it adds some really great and usable tension. Thanks a lot for watching this video and taking an interest in my channel. Please help me reach a larger audience by hitting subscribe below and ringing the notification bell. Check out my video playlist page to find the categories that most interest you. Leave me a super thanks here on YouTube and even better, come join my Patreon. Please consider buying music for my original projects ISS and High Castle Tele Orchestra. Also, don't forget to sign up for my email list on the front page of timsmolens.com. You can find information about all of those things in the description below. Thanks again.